What's up YouTube? It's Jacob from International Precision Engineering and I'm talking about creating a spherical microwave cavity. The reason I'm talking about this is because I see a lot of people making magnetron guns where they stick the magnetron in sort of on this board and point it at things and really all they can get it to do is sort of light up fluorescent bulbs and trip their circuit breakers. Then the funny thing, the real funny thing is, is everybody's an expert on the internet, right? So you start looking at these comments and, oh, you're going to die, and oh, this is, <laughs> this is crazy. And if you would have got an education, you'd know that it has to be in a resonating chamber and all this and all that. So I just wanted to take a, a closer look at sort of what's involved in sort of a fun application of exploding some fruit. And if it's feasible we'll build it, but I'm going to spoil it for you. It, I'm, I don't think it's feasible and this is why. The basic concept is we take something like a tomato and put it in between two spherical reflectors and point a magnetron at it. Even though the picture looks like sort of a C here, really it's actually like a satellite dish, right? So we take two of them and put the magnetron in there with the tomato right in the center. When you turn the magnetron on, the microwaves come out of the side, not the front. So you need some kind of waveguide that reflects the microwaves out to the front, okay? And that's what we have here. So it's like a 35 degree angle on the side and the microwave shown here as waves, totally not to scale, but they're coming out and hitting this tomato. And instead of two beams, this is circular, right? So this would be like a section view. When the, when the microwaves hit the object, they're going to reflect, they're going to absorb, and some of them, when they absorb, are going to re-emit new microwaves, and it kind of happens all over. So keep in mind that if your reflectors aren't totally enclosing this, then microwaves are going to be blasting everywhere. So you see a lot of videos online, and look at the comments, and they talk about, oh, you're going to die, and you're going to get cancer. Well, just keep in mind that this happens. The important thing to note is that everything up to this point is at fractions of the power that this has the capability to produce, and that's because there's no resonator cavity. So what's going to happen with these reflectors is as these microwaves come out and reflect off of our spherical reflector, they're going to come back and converge, right? And then it's going to produce more and they're going to come back and they're going to reflect and it's just going to keep going back and forth. And then what's going to happen is it's going to produce a standing wave within the region of the two reflectors, okay? So keep in mind that this is a spherical wave, not a linear wave. And what's going to happen is the energy field is going to collapse on the tomato, expand, reflect, collapse on the tomato, and it's going to keep doing that until this entire system is at resonance, okay? And it's going to be determined by a lot of things we'll talk about, but just this is the principle. This is what we want. We want a lot of that energy converging on the tomato, expanding, converging, expanding, and it's going to flip those dipoles and hopefully kill our tomato. Again, there's countless videos on the internet where people take apart micro microwaves, put the magnetron on the front of a board or something, and then just sprinkle all the circuitry behind it and then start pointing it at things. Well, they pointed at marshmallows, they, one of the videos, there was a tomato right on the front of the antenna that did almost nothing and disappointed almost everybody who watched it. So let's run through some of the math to find out what we have to do to get this thing to do what we want it to do. On the left of this slide is a table containing a bunch of different materials and their specific heat. The specific heat is how much energy an object takes per mass, so this is specific heat. How much energy per unit mass it takes to raise that by one degree, and in this case Celsius. So some of the materials here, tomato, that's what we're interested in, is about, about four. There's beef, hamburger, it's also four brains, right? Almost exactly the same as hamburger, so if you're interested in that. Notice bacon is about half, okay? So that's why when you put bacon in your microwave, that's one of the reasons why it heats up so fast. 
raisins even lower, right? So what's the trend? Salty and dry foods or with less water heat up faster, right? And tongue, there's different kinds of tongue in this chart. By the way, all of the references in this presentation, anytime there's a bracketed number are shown down here and maybe I'll put a link in the description. But yeah, the funny things like brain and tongue, very entertaining when you peruse the internet looking for things. Anyway, what does this mean for us, right? So if we take the sort of equation for specific heat that's kilojoules per kilogram degree Celsius and what's a kilojoule, right? So our microwave is rated in kilowatts or watts and that's just a kilojoule per second. So combining the equations, what we're interested in here maybe is how long it's going to take to say get something up to temperature to boil per kilowatt given a specific heat right and mass so putting in some numbers for our tomato here online uh, the mass of a tomato I got is 17 grams okay and I want to take it from 0 Celsius to 100 Celsius just a number and then uh, we take the specific heat of the tomato and then most of the microwaves that I found online were right at about a kilowatt, okay, 1.2 or 800. What I think that is, is they're using all the same magnetrons. They're probably just coming off a line in China by the hundreds and they're putting them all in the microwaves. And I think the difference in power comes from the design of the chamber itself. How much time did they spend making that or optimizing all of the different components in that microwave. I think that's just my speculation. But in any case, they're all about one kilowatt, so let's run those numbers. So if we wanted to heat a tomato that's 17 grams to 100 degrees from zero in a one kilowatt microwave, assuming that we put all of that energy into that tomato, it's going to take 6.8 seconds. Well, that's boiling from freezing, so maybe if we're only going from, say, 50, if we preheat the tomato and then turn it on and then we're going to want to boil this thing, maybe that gets cut in half. But a boiling, almost boiling tomato isn't very entertaining, so we want to vaporize the tomato, okay? And then this is really the sort of the paralyzing component in this whole process. So the latent heat of vaporization is 2,200 kilojoules per kilogram. And I heard somewhere, and I can't find the reference, but I heard that the, the latent heat and specific heat of water are among the highest materials in the entire universe. So when we try and vaporize water or something that's made mostly of water, it's going to take a lot of energy. Okay, so when we want this thing to explode, we want to turn this tomato into steam, it's going to take a lot of energy or a lot of time. So running the numbers again, okay, so it's the same equation but without the delta C because it's, there's no temperature change from a, a liquid to a gas, okay. You're looking at something like 40 seconds. You're, you're on the time scale of minutes and that's assuming that you can get all of that energy into that tomato. So this to me is not very exciting. So what I want to do is pour so much energy into that tomato that it has nowhere to go and the, the sort of the shell contains the steam until it just it's there one second and it's gone the next. So I can think of two ways to bring that number down. One, add more magnetrons, right? So here, instead of having two, we've got six, one on every side of sort of a cube. And then the second way is optimize the wave patterns and the mode shapes to sort of localize that energy right into the center of that tomato. And hopefully the center center, even like through the skin. One of the challenges with just adding more sources or energy sources is that if the magnetrons aren't all producing the same exact frequency, or if they are producing the same exact frequency, one is out of phase from the other, the, the wave pattern that gets generated is 
not straightforward. So the amplitudes don't just add. If I point two magnetrons at each other, the amplitude is not, or the energy in there is not double what you think it is, or double of each, what each could put out. Instead, you get some complicated sine wave, and, and really they start fighting each other, right? The good thing is that with a, any resonant system, maybe not any, but most resonant systems just naturally want to synchronize. So if you look at, there's plenty of examples of this online. One of them, like the first one that was documented is Christian Huygens' clocks, where he noticed two pendulum clocks on the same wall synchronized over, I don't know, months or days or maybe even hours. But if you, if you don't believe me, just Google synchronizing metronomes, right? And then this experiment here, two metronomes of close to the same frequency started out of phase on a sort of free base will align themselves within seconds. It's kind of amazing to see, but it's true. And so what this means for us is if we patch all of these magnetrons together, nature will help us out and will synchronize both the frequency and the phase of all of them because they're all resonant systems in themselves and it's in a resonant cavity the impedance will drive that back and then eventually all six of them or however many you have will stabilize to almost the same frequency and in phase with each other even with that said if it's possible and it works, and we can couple all the energy from every single one of those into our tomato, it still only divides our time by about one-sixth, right? So linear relationship with time. So 40 seconds plus six, so you're talking almost 50 seconds, so you're still talking something like five to 10 seconds to even do that, okay? And that's not fast enough for me. Back to the two ways of how we could plausibly shorten that time, let's look at the mode shapes. If you've ever looked into how a gun type nuclear bomb works, essentially what they do is they take two subcritical masses and they keep them separated so they're stable when they're separate but if they touch the mass becomes critical and it starts to produce energy, pushing them back apart, okay, or vaporizing them, which the particles spread apart and then the critical mass goes away. The challenge with this type of nuclear bomb is that you want to smash those two critical masses together and then hold them there as long as possible so that all those neutrons can come in and react and more and create more and more and more. So the, the more contained you keep that reaction, the bigger the pop's gonna be, okay? So it's kind of the same thing with our tomato. What we want is we almost wanna flash freeze this tomato so that our skin, it has a lot of strength and rigidity, and then we wanna vaporize just the interior so that all that pressure has to fight that shell and then it just can't do it and then pop. That's, that's what I envision. So the more focus that we can get our energy into the center of that tomato, the better. If you go online and look at how a microwave works, okay, you're gonna see probably like a picture like this, depending on where you start and what questions you ask, right? So this sort of almost oversimplistic single wave model, which this, this model has a lot of merit and what's nice about it is in physics, introductory physics, you can go and look at wave equations and you can solve them and you can see how uh, two different waves add and you can graph it and you can do all sorts of things. But in reality, this is so simplistic, it's almost not even representative of what's going on in this microwave. So this would be like high school physics or maybe even undergrad physics, depending on where you're going. And then in sort of grad school, you kind of graduate to this sort of 2D sections and maybe sort of, sort of like conceptual 3D, but we're going to study these 2D slices. But in reality, this is really kind of what it looks like. So here we design these really nice optimal sort of mode shapes, but 
in reality, it's so complex that they design these things with computers, and if something's not right, they, they kind of push out a wall, and it's the same way that cars are really designed with aerodynamics, right? If there's a, an eddy or something, they'll go in and scrape it or push the surface in the computer and try it again, right? So it's kind of this iterative process, but this is kind of what we're working with, right? And then another thing that's really important to point out on this slide is that so this 2.5 gigahertz is this sort of design frequency for a magnetron okay but look what happens if you go down to 2.2 or up to 2.7 you completely lose your mode shape and now you're into something different so it's really important that if you're going to build anything that you know what frequency it's going to operate and we'll talk more about that so what's a mode shape <laughs> A mode shape is really kind of like a what does what is sort of the energy distribution within this cavity, okay? And, and if we design it correctly, what's going to happen is we're going to produce standing waves, okay? So in our sort of spherical shell, okay, and this is sort of what the wave might look like if we took a section of this, okay, where the amplitude is the energy distribution or the sort of electrical polarity of the wave, okay? But keep in mind though that these are spherical waves, okay? So it really, if you wanted to draw this right, it might look like an onion, where like it's concentric layers of high energy and negative energy, plus minus, right? And then they're expanding and contracting and expanding and contracting, but that, if you look into standing waves, again, back to our sort of, um, a linear model where it's one frequency and one wave's going this way and the other's coming this way, it's really easy to see and understand how it can create a standing wave if you have the cavity designed with the wavelength in mind. And if we look at the bottom of the slide here, what we can see is different mode shapes, okay, and that would be like first harmonic, second harmonic, but instead of being linearly along the line, they're sort of influenced by the entire surface of the sphere, okay? So here would be like the first mode, and there's more of these if you're interested to check out this Bessel function or like drum head modes or, or membrane, thin membrane modes. Okay, but the sort of zero one mode, zero meaning that there's zero modes in its circumference. Okay, so we're only interested in symmetry in our sphere. Okay, so the zero one mode is the entire the entire sphere sort of coming in and coming out, coming in and coming out. The, the field across all the way up to the boundary is flipping. If we go to the second mode, there's going to be a sort of a spherical surface that doesn't change. Okay, so if you look at standing waves on a line, that's, that's the node. Okay, so for a 2D um, standing wave, those are going to be lines, and on 3D they're actually surfaces. Okay, so the second mode, again, are, we have a fixed boundary, just because that's the way E and M waves work on a perfectly conductive surface. We've got another node in here, and then we've got two modes, okay? We've got one at the center, and then one as a surface between the node, and then the node from the actual reflecting surface itself. And then just to show you, here's the third mode, okay, and then we can pick any one of these that we sort of want to uh, interface at. So looking a little bit more theoretical, this is sort of a section of this, and again it's sort of a, a implied section of the sphere, it's an energy, energy distribution along one line through that sphere, okay, so it's not really a plane, it's just along one line, okay, and then we graph in the y direction here or z direction whatever however you want to look at it is just wave amplitude okay and let's look at this a little bit closer a couple interesting things to think about when we want to design sort of our mode shape for our sphere if this blue areas are sort of energy right so it's it's an electric field switching and a magnetic field coming on and, and it's kind of coming back and forth if we integrate all of these sort of flipping 
things. That's we can think of that as our uh, sort of capacity to drive heat into our object, right? So this is sort of like the bound energy of the system. So if we design this so that our reflecting uh, surfaces are here, then we integrate the energy in here and then that's going to get sort of transferred into our tomato sort of when those waves come and smash together. So clearly the, the, the farther out, the bigger, so if this is a set wavelength, the bigger that we make our sphere, the more energy we're going to have to smash into the center of that. So it's sort of like, it's not the higher Q, but the sort of the more energy we're going to get, the more localized energy we're going to get into the center of that tomato. Another thing that you probably miss if you didn't really, really run through the numbers is the fact that this center mode is actually a full wavelength wide, even though it's one or, or the entire width is positive. So if you think of normal sine wave equations from node to node is one half the wavelength, but with the sync function, it's actually a full wavelength wide. That's at its peak, and it has to do with the way that the two sort of sync functions that are crossing each other, remember the waves are expanding and converging, so it's two um, you know, opposing waves, but they're two opposing sync function waves, okay? And, and you, that's why my green line sort of has this dip here. So when it's at its max and its min, those two peaks drive together and, and pull up that center peak even higher, and that's like extra energy in there. But then as it's coming down, you start getting this dip as those two peaks separate and come out, okay? So if you're gonna build this, keep in mind that this is a full wavelength wide and then we go out half wavelengths from there. From this diagram, obviously, as we talked about, we wanna set our boundary condition so we already know that, remember, the magnetron works at 2.54 gigahertz, right, or whatever, four or five. We want to design our wavelength so that our boundary condition is exactly at a node, okay? And then, so what that says is we can only make the diameter or the radius of this sphere in, in uh, half or in radius as half wavelengths and the diameter as integer wavelengths in size, okay? So we have discrete sort of sizes that we can build given that we're driving this with a pre-designed magnetron. Keep in mind though that this is all normalized to wavelength, okay? So everything up until now was theoretical, so, and it's all from generic wavelength. I don't think that the mode shape really buys us anything. And the reason is, I don't think that we can drive enough energy into such a small point, given the size of our tomato and the, and the sort of the size of the wavelength, I don't think that we can drive enough energy into the center and not the edges to actually sort of have this explosion come out from the center. I think that all of the sort of optimizing that mode shape, the only thing I think that will do is make our calculated time more realistic. So I'm going to say that we don't buy anything by making a spherical cavity other than uh, driving almost all of that energy from the magnetron into our fruit instead of into the walls, okay? So to me, when we did our estimations, we said all of that energy, you know, the full kilowatt was going into those numbers. So to me, I think that it just makes those numbers more realistic. Okay, adding more magnetrons really just reduces the time by the number of them, but it also increases the complexity. And remember that every single one of these has to operate at the same exact frequency. So if your sphere is not spherical and it's sort of like elliptical, well, there's, guess what? There's a different resonance in one width than the other or the length, right? If it's like a football, the waves travel longer across from tip to tip than they do sort of up and down. So if you if we had really high tolerance manufacturing and a lot of time and effort to put into this, I think that we could do it. But 
realistically, I think that this is probably maybe only going to provide for having six over one, it's probably only going to cut the time down by a third. That's just a guess. The real reason that I don't, that I'm not, that you don't see one in this video, that even though it would look amazing, is this. Okay, so, and, and read this first if you're going to do any research on microwave ovens, but it's the, it's the fact that when you design this resonator cavity, there's, some, there's a dielectric in it that destroys all of your sort of simple equations, okay? So what this figure here says is the two conditions. One is the microwave with food and the microwave without food. And I don't know how much or anything like that, but just know that food changes the dynamics of what's going on inside that cavity. So what's going on here is these two different conditions are just two different modes of resonance. So, and, and they're relating this to a rectangular cuboid or whatever the word for like that oblong rectangular box that most microwaves are. Sort of along its length is going to be one mode and then along its width would be another, for example. Okay, so the dotted line and the, and the red line are just those two different conditions. But what you see is, okay, so A without food, notice the really high Q peaks, okay? So with frequency along the x-axis and Q, which me just means the ratio of the width to the height, okay? Along the uh, vertical axis, and, and they do say that they're not to scale, okay? So just ignore that, it's not important. But notice that not only does the sort of the Q peak from the condition on the top to the condition on the bottom, so we're saying that the microwave without food is on top and the microwave with food is on the bottom for two different mode shapes. Okay, on the top is really high Q, so I have really awesome resonance. It's working exactly as it's designed until I put food in it. And then it's like, <laughs> okay, and remember that with those mode shapes, if frequency changes, so does the mode shapes, okay? And that's why there's sort of this broadbanding effect when you put food in there. Not only that, but look at this. This gray line here represents the design frequency of the magnetron. So remember that same thing with Huygens clocks, okay? The magnetron will sort of pump in what it can, but the standing waves within the microwave will feed back into the magnetron and it'll sort of balance itself out. It'll find that steady state and it's going to operate even if it's outside of the frequency of the magnetron. As long as it's close, it's fine. It won't destroy it like they say online, but it's not going to operate at exactly that frequency that it was designed, okay? And then that's the sort of shifting of these bands. What's really important in this figure is to see that, okay, where is my power? So if my magnetron puts out this sort of frequency spectrum and my resonator cavity resonates at a certain frequency, it's a real stretch to come over here. I'm not putting much power into that cavity when there's no food. Okay, so then they design it essentially so that when there is food and that frequency shifts, it is driving more power, but how much? So if you notice this sort of red mode, if it's operating at the peak frequency, it's producing almost no power. There's almost no overlap in there whatsoever. But in the other mode, it's almost right on. The, the, the sort of takeaway from this and the destroyer of all this sort of fun is that one, there's just not enough power in these magnetrons to do anything cinematically fantastic, okay? And two, if you don't know what that dielectric's gonna do to your resonant system, all your numbers sort of are just guesses, okay? So between those two facts, this is where I'm ending. If you're still with me, thank you for watching. I really enjoy the support that I get from my channel. If you like this stuff and wanna see more, don't forget to subscribe. And most importantly, if there's things that you don't agree with, I'm not an expert, I don't claim to be. If there's sort of over-exaggerated over assumptions or anything, leave a comment. I'm sure that other people would love to argue with you about it. And I, I think it's entertaining myself. And to be honest, it's all in good fun. So thank you. We'll see you next time.